You're live. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Morris. I'm a senior missions counselor here at Harrisburg University Science and Technology. Um, and welcome to another installment of the HU webinar series. Um, we got two awesome guests here today. Um, gonna speak to you a little bit about our environmental science program and also geospatial technology. Um, just real quick reminder, everybody is muted, um, so you won't be able to speak with us, but we do encourage you to ask questions um, because we will be hosting a Q&A portion towards the end of the seminar. So have any questions throughout, um, please feel free, type those questions into the Q&A. Um, and also this is being recorded. Um, so if you wanna go back, watch this later, or maybe check out one of the webinars that you weren't able to see previously, I will post the link in the chat so that way you can take a look at some of the previous webinars we've done here at HU. All right, so without any further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to pass it off to Dr. Cross Christine Proctor. Um, so I'm gonna start us off here talking a little bit about the Environmental Science Sustainability Program here at Harrisburg University. I think we lost her connection. Can you guys hear me again? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Awesome, okay. All right, so sorry everyone uh, for that little bit of disconnectivity. Um, am I still here or no? Yep, okay, yes. good. Cause I just got something across my screen that said bad network quality. So wasn't sure. <laughs> All right, um, so again, my name is Christine Proctor. I am the program lead for uh, environmental science and sustainability program here at Harrisburg University. Um, my background is ecology and I also uh, teach in the geospatial technology program. We have one other full-time faculty member in the program and that is Mike Meyer and he is a geologist. But we also have three uh, part-time or what we call corporate faculty that teach within the program and we call them corporate faculty because they all have industry experience which is really great to connect our students with people who are currently working um, as professionals in the field. Uh, we have Jennifer Slico who is also a geologist. She is also a uh, specialist in online pedagogy for um, the National sciences. So she's helping us develop out some of our classes so we in the future will be able to offer them entirely online and in person. Um, our other two uh, faculty members we have in the program are Greg Zarnecki and Nathan Riegel. Both of them work uh, full-time within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources for the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Greg Zarnecki works on climate uh, action plan for the state of Pennsylvania and he teaches a great uh, class within the program about climate policy, climate communication, and what he's able to do is build on his connections and he connects our students with communities looking to build climate action plans and he actually has the students build out those plans for those uh, community organizations. Nathan Riegel is an um, ecosystem restoration ecologist and uh, he teaches a couple of classes for us within the program and each one of those classes he's able to take the students out with him and into the field and so they get some really hands-on practical experience with some of the things that they're doing within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, just a little bit of introduction into what environmental science is. Environmental science is relatively broad um, and it, the, the basis behind it is that we're studying the natural environment and human impacts on those environments. But some of the topics that we include uh, could be energy consumption, resource management, um, wildlife management, forestry, waste management, green development, um, environmental education, climate policy. All of those things fall within the realm of environmental science. We are very interdisciplinary and we partner with many of the other programs at Harrisburg University. Uh, the environmental science field is one of the fastest growing fields in the job market. It is projected to grow by 8% between 2018 and 2028. 
Um, and some of the common jobs that people get with an environmental science degree include resource managers, um, environmental science and engineering companies. And so there are a lot of uh, environmental consulting firms that hire environmental scientists. Um, many of our students go on to work for government agencies, so state, federal, or even local municipalities. Um, and then there's always nonprofits. We've also had students go on to graduate school. So graduate school um, can include geospatial technologies, uh, geology, environmental science, natural resource programs. Um, and one of the benefits to our program at Harrisburg University is that we are located in the state's capital. So we have a really strong working relationship with the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, with Department of Environmental Protection, the Game Commission, the Geologic Survey, Fish and Boat Commission, um, Susquehanna River Basin Commission, Western Pennsylvania uh, Conservancy, Nature Conservancy, they all have offices right here um, in Harrisburg. And so we've got great working relationships to get our students in there and get experience. Um, we at Harrisburg University across the board, we really value experiential learning and we do that in the program in several ways. Um, in our classes, we get the students out as much as possible. And some of the photos you see here on the slide are students who are actually out in uh, during one of their class sessions, really getting out in the field and getting that hands on experience. Um, we also do a lot of community based projects. One of the projects we're going to highlight uh, a little bit later on um, in this presentation is one that we did it with the geospatial uh, technology program, but we engage um, local communities and we kind of go out there and we we get our students connected with them and working on some of these projects um, so they get really good hands on experience. Um, right now, the environmental science program, it was formerly a concentration in integrated science. The 2019-2020 academic year is the first year it was its own standalone program. Currently, it has one concentration, which is the natural resource management concentration, but uh, we are growing and we're going to split it out eventually and to have three total concentrations, one in geospatial applications and the other in sustainability. Um, for internships, uh, we really partner again with those local agencies um, so that our students can now get out there and get some real world applicable experience. It's important for us that when our students do internships and research, do their project one, project two, that's a re the research component in Harrisburg University, that they do that uh, in partnership with an outside organization so they get that experience. We've had our students do internships with the Game Commission, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, the National Park Service, Moat Marine Laboratory. Um, we've also had them do internships out of state uh, with well, Moat Marine Laboratories in Florida and with uh, the Baltimore, Baltimore County Department of uh, Resource Management and Protection. And as I mentioned a little early on in the presentation, because it's so interdisciplinary, we often partner with other programs. We partner quite often with geospatial technology, which is why we're doing this as a joint presentation. Um, but we also have our students um, partner with the Aquaponics Center and within the Integrated Science Program. Um, and at this point, I would like to turn it over to Professor Sarvis. We can talk about the geospatial program, and then we're going to go back and talk about some of those partnerships and how the two programs work so closely together. All right, thank you, Christine. OK, so I um, often need to start with uh, a bit of a description of what geospatial technology is because quite so uh, quite often um, folks coming up from high school haven't had exposure to this particular technology or at least didn't realize they had exposure to it. So I'll do a quick uh, overview of what geospatial technology is and then get into some of the details of our program before we move on to some of the examples of the projects we've done. So I often like to start with this streetscape. Um, this is right outside of Market Street, right outside of Harrisburg University. There we are right pretty much um, right in the center. And as we bring in these arrows, every single thing that an arrow is pointing to occupies a location on the earth. And quite often in most of these cases, 
this piece of information and its location is stored somewhere, either in a database or in a notebook or a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, and as we bring in these items, you'll notice that all of these things could be related to different organizations. Uh, might be the city of Harrisburg, might be PennDOT, might be the utilities that keep track of it, uh, the public works department, I've got a fleet vehicle in here. Um, so all of these items and probably many, many more exist somewhere in a database uh, or a digital form. But the point I wanna make is all of these things also have a spatial component or spatial location. Uh, and really when you start to think about that, the power of geospatial technology uh, becomes really evident and it, it's pervasive because so many things um, are related to a location that by being able to map and analyze that information from a spatial standpoint, uh, that's really what geospatial technology is. Um, what is geospatial technology um, from an academic standpoint? Well, it's really three main tools and then lots of different sort of supporting technologies that help to work with these tools. Um, everybody's heard of GPS or global positioning systems. Uh, you may have heard the term remote sensing before, but that's actually, you know, being able to uh, sense the surface of the earth remotely with different kinds of sensors. Um, GPS, of course, is precise locations. And then at the bottom here is geographic information systems. And we pull all this information together, the precise locations, the, the highly accurate high resolution imagery from satellites or aircraft or even drones into a system, a computer system that allows us to manipulate, manage, store, edit, um, and, and really then analyze and finally produce maps to help solve problems. Um, a, a quote I like to use um, that was coined maybe 20, 30 years ago, said so at least 80% of all data has a spatial component. So if you think back to my previous slide of the city of Harrisburg and all those items that have a spatial location or a, or a, a spatial attribute, or spatial um, element to it, it really drives home the point that because of all this information, having a spatial location, being able to use this technology to manage it, to analyze it, to, to solve problems is really what geospatial technology is all about. So briefly, you want to talk about each of these types of systems. Global positioning systems, again, precise measurements for mapping. Um, so we have a lot of different systems. This particular image happens to be a survey grade GPS piece of equipment. Uh, another one that the university owns here is a new Trimble device that we just purchased. Um, and even little Bluetooth devices that we use in our summer camps to capture coordinates uh, to understand what uh, those precise locations are on the Earth. So that's the first step, being able to measure those things. Then we have remote sensing, right? Capturing images of the Earth from a remote location. This particular image happens to be what we call a point cloud, which is generated from uh, something like 300 images that were captured from a drone flying at 400 feet. And because we are moving and taking pictures from different angles, we can generate these 3D point clouds um, to represent the surface of the Earth. So it's not just a straight, uh, straight down photo that you might be used to seeing on Google Earth we can actually generate three-dimensional models. Here's that same image with all of the uh, individual drone images taken from above and how many of those images actually can point to one location on the ground, generating this 3D model of this particular high school track. Um, we use remote sensing uh, and drones again in archeology, span and this happens to be from one of the field trips we did uh, to Greece a couple of years ago. You can see some circular patterns here on the ground. These are evidence of threshing floors where they used to process grains uh, in a remote village in the Peloponnese Peninsula of Greece. Um, you know, structures that may be enabled to, to see on the ground, but by flying above, we can really pick these things out. Uh, and then you may have noticed or remembered this from uh, Christine Proctor's slide. This is actually a heat map from a, a satellite and satellite in orbit looking at temperatures on the surface of the Earth. So this actually happens to be Harrisburg in a July or August timeframe a few years ago. All of these remote sensing um, products that I just showed you can be brought into geographic information systems. Uh, and even here, this is just an animation. Um, you saw that 3D model of the track, um, the high school track. We can actually do the same thing for individual buildings. And this is where geospatial technology is heading. It's not just straight, images looking straight down, but actually starting to develop three-dimensional models. Uh, and then again, to, to sort of summarize what geographic information systems or geospatial technology is, we bring all that together into maps. So this happens to be a map of Harrisburg with elevation uh, shown by different colors. We can extrude those elevations up to create buildings and three-dimensional models. Uh, we can overlay zoning 
This came right from the city of Harrisburg zoning map. We can overlay this kind of information to show where regions are within the city um, and pull it all together. And uh, this is just a nice visual of what GIS uh, is all about. Lots of different components. Um, as with the environmental science program, we have a mix of full time and corporate faculty members. Uh, there I am uh, uh, on a glacier in Iceland. In fact, if you look at my background, I'm, I'm somewhere in Iceland there from a photo taken about a year ago. Um, Christine Proctor also, as she mentions, teaches uh, some of the remote sensing and even the applied GIS classes. And then we have corporate faculty, uh, two of which currently are teaching, Kristen Ditterline and Joel Rogers, both from a local company called GeoDecisions that does GIS and geospatial consulting. Um, some of the other photos are just some of us in the field. And Craig Lewis here, for example, with the drones with, with Christine Proctor, uh, runs our geospatial technology center, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, but all these folks bring in academic and industry expertise, right? And this, this expertise overlaps often with the environmental science program. But we want to bring in these working professionals so they can actually, um, you know, tell you what's going on in the real world today. Um, this is, you know, I'm not going to go through this entire thing, but this lists out the main courses or the core courses of the geospatial technology program. On the right, you kind of see the areas of study. There's geography, the geographic information systems, cartography, map making. Uh, some math with numeric and spatial statistics, um, understanding databases and application development. Uh, there may be questions about how computer science plays into this program, and, and we do have a, a foundation of Python and JavaScript that's taught so that students have that basic knowledge. Remote sensing, and then even GIS management and policy. Um, and I would want to make sure that people realize that um, just like environmental science, the geospatial technology industry is predicted to grow something in the order of 11% over the next five to 10 years. Um, which is a little bit faster than normal. It's a, one of the higher rated prospects by the U.S. Department of Labor. And we developed the program around a competency model that the Department of Labor has put together. So this is an industry, people in industry are aware of what these competencies are for people working in the industry, and that's how we've developed our program. And my last slide talks again about experiential learning. Um, all of us at the university are very proud of the fact that we have this experiential learning component of your education at HU. Um, not only internships, which many schools offer, um, we require an internship, uh, but also research and applied projects, a like project one and project two that all students are required to do. That's nine credits of experiential learning. Um, some of the internships that I'd like to highlight, um, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. We had a student do uh, two summers of interns down in at the, <clears throat> actually at the uh, at the CIA headquarters, believe it or not, uh, for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and ended up getting a job right out of college uh, with that particular organization. But, uh, you know, federal government, state government, uh, county, uh, water companies, uh, PennDOT, lots of different internship opportunities that students have worked for. Uh, and those research and applied projects, um, this is where students get to really sort of explore what they're mostly interested in. Because geospatial technology, as I mentioned before, is so broadly applied, you know, 80% of all data, um, students go into a lot of different, um, different things that they're interested in. Uh, so one person looked at bus stop accessibility and the amount of sidewalks and how far away from a bus stop are these sidewalks. Crime and forensics mapping, using drones for mapping, looking at historical census data, lots of different uh, ways of applying your knowledge. <clears throat> um, one key thing about the program, and this stands for both geospatial and environmental science, is our Center for Applied Environmental and Geospatial Technology. We recently just rebranded this to include environmental science, um, but this is these are grants and external projects that the center is generating and we have students working on. So imagine when you graduate having been paid for up to two to 3,000 hours while you're in school, 15, 20 hours a week, maybe even full time over the summer, um, working in your industry while you're going to school, not just the internships and applied projects. This isn't actually a job you can have at the university. Um, this, uh, according to a recent alumni survey, was one of the top things they mentioned that uh, helped them get their jobs. And I'd be remiss if I didn't end on some of the, the fact that we have lots of field studies opportunities. Um, every other year we go to Iceland. Uh, we were, were meant to go to Greece in a couple of weeks. Obviously, that's been canceled. Uh, we're pretty bummed about that. But we also have taken students to Grand Cayman and other locations for projects um, that we've done within the university. Um, so I want to switch back to um, a few other applications now. <clears throat> One thing that we should note is there is 
um, a series of internal um, research projects or grant money that folks and faculty at the university can get from the university to, to work on projects um, outside the university. We must involve students. It's another great opportunity for students. It might be their internship. It might be a part of their project. Um, but two of those examples are uh, some projects we're going to talk about right now. One has to do with acid mine drainage um, in Pennsylvania. And the second one has to do with some census data uh, for the city of Harrisburg around the turn of the century. Um, Christine, do you want to take a, a stab at talking about the, the acid mine drainage project? Sure. Um, and so this is an, one of those projects that was a partnership between um, environmental science and geospatial technology and integrated sciences. Actually, we had some chemist, chemistry in there as well. Um, and what we did here is that we partnered with the uh, Schuylkill Conservation District. It is uh, Schuylkill County um, is one of the areas that has been hard hit with some water quality issues related to abandoned mines. Um, and they have been working really hard to clean up their water, but um, they needed some help to go in and assess how some of their remediation um, has been going. And they wanted a way to communicate this with, to the public. And so we had an environmental science student go in and look at how the ecology and how healthy the water seemed to be from a, an ecology as from a from a fish perspective. Um, we had a student who went in there and collected, it was actually um, an environmental science student who wow. is specializing in environmental chem and partnered with a chemistry professor to look at the water quality. How's the water quality been improving? And then we had a geospatial student uh, come in and put this all into, and what uh, Professor Sarvis is showing on his screen um, is a, a story map. And so it's a way for the, the Schuylkill Conservation District to be able to share with the public the work that they've been doing and how they've been working to really get the health of those streams back up for the community who really count on um, the streams in that watershed for recreation and for fishing. Um, and so it, it's it just really highlights some of the, the strengths in our program that we're able to do these cross program collaborations and have our students working with um, local government organizations and get in there in the community and get some hands on experience and um, kind of work towards solving a problem. And it was a great experience for everybody involved. And we're still collecting data for the Schuylkill Conservation District. Thanks. Yeah. And another another project that was funded through through the university um, in collaboration with another local school, Messiah College, their history and archaeology department. What you're looking at on the map now is the city of Harrisburg. And many people don't realize that um, prior to about 1912, there was a thriving community back behind the state capitol building. And this particular map allows us to um, swipe an historic map back over the current day map to see what things look like in the past. And as we zoom in here behind the Capitol building, um, you'll notice that back in 1901, there were hundreds and hundreds of individual buildings and individual people that lived in those buildings that we were able to pull together from census data. <clears throat> so just this one particular home here, Samuel uh, uh, Wenrich was a boarder. He's a white male that lived in the house. He was 28 years old. Um, he was from New York. His parents were from Germany and he was a baker. Right. And there's six people that live in this house and we can actually step through and look at everybody who lived in that particular house. Um, this particular project has been really useful because there's a um, campaign right now in the city of Harrisburg to help people understand what was going on back here behind the Capitol building um, prior to it being demolished and all of the <clears throat> current buildings and structures being put in. So it's a little that, you know, here's GIS being able to reveal what our history has been. Um, and we took all this information and all these census points of all the individuals that lived in the city and not only 1900, but 1910, 20 and 30. And we can look at the demographic makeup and the shifts of people and ethnicities through the city over time. It's been a really a fascinating insight into, um, into the city itself. Um, another project we want to talk about, there was a real collaboration between environmental science and geospatial technology. And I'm going to let Dr. Christine Proctor talk about this one. Uh, was using our um, using our uh, drone technology and remote sensing from geospatial technology and combining it with um, environmental science. So, Christine, I'll let you talk about this too. Okay. Um, yeah. So, 
one of uh, one of the projects that um, both uh, Professor Sarvas and myself have worked on um, is how do we leverage this all this drone technology that we now have to um, improve wildlife detection. Um, so my background actually is in wildlife biology and um, there are several species that are really hard to detect. Um, and I had this kind of crazy idea and everybody said that we were absolutely crazy to try this, but we wanted to use drone technology to survey for reptiles. And in particular, we wanted to use thermal detection. Um, we know that we're increasing the use of drones for wildlife. It's happening all over the place. And the, what you can see on the slide right now is using drones to count elephants. It's particularly easy to count wildlife when you've got really, um, and then here are some shorebirds that flock together in large groups, or you've got elephants that are really relatively large. However, the challenge comes in, if you wanna to move to the next slide, is instead of having um, conspicuous, what about cryptic? Instead of really large, what about small? Um, and so what's on the screen there is actually the first species that we tried this technology with, and it's a small snake. And so I wanted to see if we could use a thermal camera mounted to, the, to a drone to survey for reptiles. Everybody thought it was crazy because everybody's first response are our reptiles are cold blooded, but um, they still have to behaviorally increase their temperature to do things like digestion or gestation uh, for pregnant females. And so we thought this might work. And so in the center of the screen, and I don't know if you can circle around where that snake is, but that picture was taken um, with my uh, cell phone camera just kind of squatting down and really close and it's very hard to see. So we want to see if we could use this technology to um, improve detection. So go ahead, next slide. And we knew thermal worked for mammals, but would it work for a reptile? Next slide. Lo and behold, it did. So the other species that we um, did this on was with the uh, green iguana in the Cayman Islands. And you guys can see right there on the screen, you can get a really nice image of the iguana using the thermal camera. You can see its tails, its legs, its feet. Um, so it was pretty successful. And what was really exciting about this, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide, is that we got to use students in the process and we even brought an environmental science student and a geospatial technology student um, out to the Cayman Islands and we've also been out to Slippery Rock in western Pennsylvania for the uh, snake study and so we were able to include students in this entire research process um, and they learn a lot from that because the method did work but it wasn't perfect and they got to learn how do you come up with a methodology and understand where it's strong and where it's weak and then how do you communicate that and what you're seeing there in that video playing is uh, the Im same image, image of that snake in that little cell phone picture but through the thermal camera and you can see that you see it much better using that thermal technology. Thanks, Christine. One of the um, we keep emphasizing the collaboration between our two programs. We also we actually have a class um, that's actually called um, do environmental field techniques. And uh, we actually got to do some work out at the Pennsylvania Farm Show Complex. Uh, this is uh, would it be three years this fall, I think, Christine, that um, they have a flooding problem back behind the Capitol complex. And so we met, had a mix of geospatial and environmental science students to go back and, and do a mix of environmental uh, water, water quality monitoring to do some mapping of the drainage basins. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see we actually had some of the utility infrastructure, the storm sewers and inlets into that stream behind, um, behind the farm show complex. We actually uh, went through and found some historical information about you know, why is it flooding now and maybe it didn't before. Um, and we actually went through and captured um, captured uh, remote sensing drone data, both visual and in this particular case, near infrared, that shows us a lot more information about vegetation patterns, biomass, that sort of thing. Here you can see the stream and you can see the trees are, are reflecting very highly in that near infrared wavelength. Um, so it was a mixture of using GPS and drone technology uh, with those environmental science pieces and putting them all together into a report, a very um, comprehensive report um, for the Farm Show Complex to help them understand the issues they had. Um, so this particular story map, as you've seen one before, is done by a student and this was their version of the report. Rather than write a 10 to 15 page report with maps and graphs and things like that embedded, we could actually have an interactive 
um, report that we could be online where you can actually go in and click on information about the map and really interact with it. And these, these story maps and, and web map technologies that we've been using have been really popular and they're, they're, um, they're great ways to showcase that, that you pulled all, this, all these skills together uh, into one particular um, marketable package for students looking for degrees and looking for jobs after their degrees. Um, I have one other one I wanted to show that relates to geospatial, and then I think we're gonna end on a virtual field studies uh, effort that's been going on most recently. Um, just to emphasize what geospatial technology can do really quickly, this particular map of Pennsylvania, all these green dots represent healthcare providers within a particular uh, healthcare services uh, package. And when the dots are larger, they're more healthcare providers, which stands to reason the Harrisburg, Lancaster area and Philadelphia, lots of people in this particular uh, healthcare provider network. Um, but what gets interesting then is we have lots of people who subscribe to this healthcare network. But let's look at actually what um, with these existing providers, if I turn on this and you should be able to see some pink show up, uh, a little hard to see, but this is a 30 minute drive time to all those providers, right? So geospatial technology allows us to go out and use the network information we have for road networks and say, okay, well, you know, how many people are within 30 minutes of these providers and how many big pockets or clear areas here in the state are areas where members are not served. Um, and so then when they get a potential provider here up in where A just showed up, uh, a new particular um, provider that wants to join their network, well, how's that gonna help? So let's turn on this new potential provider's drive time. Well, there they are, that's what they would serve. That's, that's the area they would serve within 30 minutes of their location that they're, they're suggesting to put their new facility. And I can turn on all of the members of that healthcare organization that were outside of the original 30 minute drive time. Um, I could turn that on, there you go. And maybe a little hard to see uh, through, through the internet, but we have lots of little red dots in this potential provider area, which means that, hey, this is a good idea. Let's bring this new provider on because we have lots of members who might be able to take advantage of that. Um, that particular uh, new provider's location. Um, so these online maps you may have seen, you know, here's a COVID-19 map, lots of opportunity. This is the same technology we use in our classroom uh, that some of these other um, organizations and, and timely maps are being produced for. Um, the last thing we wanted to show, and I'm gonna, we can both talk about this one, Christine. This is this idea of a virtual field trip. Um, and maybe you can, you can highlight it and I'll just sort of step through uh, while you're talking, Christine. Okay. Um, so the idea uh, with this uh, technology and being able to do virtual field trips, um, it serves a couple of purposes. Um, but we wanted to, one, as we are right now in a situation where we're doing more online education, but we also wanted to develop this to kind of complement or go along with in-person instruction, and it can work in both formats. But the idea of a virtual field trip um, is allows our students to get out and to look at an area and to preview it and step through it um, in to really be able to go through and get that experience and and see the kind of the different uh, features that we may be able to see when we go and walk along and in person. Um, and what we're looking at right now is an ecosystem restoration site. So this is one of the restoration sites that our corporate faculty member, Nathan Regal, it's one of his sites that he's been working on and taking students out to. And how we would use something like this. And so we walked the entire restoration. We did um, at a restoration site and then two areas that haven't currently been restored. And what we can do is the students can kind of really walk through and um, get a a really good idea of where those changes what do we see in the restored site what don't we see um, in some of these sites that the project hasn't been expanded out to and we can use this in a classroom and so we can use it to do before we go out and do the field trip we can do it after we come back from the field trip and we want to have further discussions where are some areas you would change and this really allows them to get that um, that experience as if you were out in the field and it helps to kind of enhance some of the things that we actually do. Um, and you can see that Professor Sarvis is, is stepping through it and looking at some of the pictures that we took. And we have the ability to embed in there um, additional videos, additional uh, graphs, some additional 
uh, photos to highlight some really important uh, key concepts. And what is really beneficial too in an in-person setting is to be able to do that and kind of highlight what they should be looking for when we go out in the field and it allows for a more directed experience. And I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Albert. Uh, no, just that uh, again, this is a mix of being able to use GPS points, uh, incorporating drone imagery, incorporating just straight photos. Um, and it's really, and, and students can be involved to help develop these, right? So one class might be capturing this. Imagine the Farm Show Complex project I showed you earlier, uh, where we're capturing this same information while we're doing everything else. So not only is there a story map and all that geospatial information, but we can actually have it linked to a virtual field trip like this. Um, you know, obviously this has real great applications when we're all trying to be virtual, um, but even collecting in the first place and knowing how to use this technology is, is you know, a great uh, feather to your cap when you're applying for, for schools and applying for jobs afterwards. So I'm going to jump out of the presentations now. I think we've taken about 30 minutes or so of everybody's time and uh, we'll see, uh, Brian, if you want to check on some questions. All right, sounds good. And I just want to kind of clarify here, those projects and that information that you were going over, students are involved with that as well, correct? So that, that's not just, you know, at some big universities, faculty are behind closed doors doing their research. This is all student-driven research with the assistance of the faculty. We need all the help we can get. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We involve students in every single step. Um, and, and as Professor Sarvis mentioned, even with that virtual field trip, not only do we use it as a tool in the classroom, but the students can help develop it. And we have um, uh, two students right now that are working um, with another professor who has been uh, Mike Meyer in, in the environmental science program. He has been working with Professor Sarvis and putting together some of that, uh, those virtual field trips and students are actively involved in making that happen and, and walking through through and processing and um, and so and and every um, the farm show one that was part of a class so the students got to work on that as a class and essentially the class worked as an environmental consulting firm but every single one of those involves students in every aspect of the project yeah awesome all right so let's get to some of the questions here and um, everybody watching it's still not too late to submit some questions so um, feel free to send those in First one, and this is always one of the most popular ones, um, what jobs and careers can we get out of this major? We'll start first with uh, Dr. Proctor. All right, so for environmental science, um, as I mentioned, it is highly interdisciplinary. Um, there are a lot of different ways in which um, students can go and different careers that they can. Right now, the most common careers we have students going into are working for state agencies and nonprofits um, doing environmental resource management. Um, however, uh, right now we have a student who's really interested in um, environmental chem and so is going the water quality route um, that most likely will be with a government agency, a Department of Environmental Protection protection, for example. Um, we had a student who um, was really interested in or who is really interested in environmental education. Um, so what she's doing is she's taking the information that she's learning in classes and she has actually, um, through one of her research projects, developed an environmental camp that Harrisburg University is actually um, allowing our students, but she's really focused in and so she's probably going to get a job as an educator. Um, and those are the types of jobs that she's applying for right now. We have a couple students that went on to graduate school. Um, we have a student who worked for the National Park Service. Um, but it, it really, it, it is very easy to tweak um, what you want to do within the environmental science. There's also plenty of jobs in policy. Um, and so there are, there are a lot of options. and We have the flexibility to tailor the program for students' interests. Yeah, and from my end, I, I made some mention of this earlier, but um, certainly state agencies are a big draw. Um, I've got two people who went to work for county government, one here in Dauphin County, another one in New Jersey. And actually that student then went on and used his expertise from his senior project where he used drones. And he now works for uh, an energy a branch of an energy company that does air aerial analysis of power lines and different uh, energy grids. Um, so he's using his mapping and, and drone work for that. 
the, another student went to work for the National Geospatial uh, Intelligence Agency um, down in, in Virginia. Um, and she had been stationed at different places. I think she's now teaching geographic information systems in an Air Force base down in Florida. Um, utilities are huge. Anybody that has um, assets in the field, right? Um, uh, departments of transportation, water, gas, electric utilities, all of those, those detailed pieces of information about what they have in the field have to be mapped. And so we've got folks doing that. Um, other folks have gone on to work for environmental consulting firms as their GIS specialists. Um, one went on to um, regional planning. Uh, so there are a lot of different um, places you can go, different career paths uh, with GIS, especially since it applies to so many different things. Um, and you know, with a couple of years of working in the Geospatial Technology Center, we're finding those students really do have a leg up on other people looking for jobs, not only the geospatial students, but the environmental science students who gained those GIS, GIS skills while they're here at the university. All right, thank you. Um, this next question comes from Austin. He would like to know, um, what are the differences between a geospatial technology degree or an environmental science degree with kind of a concentration in GIS? Um, one of the differences would be, um, it really is in the coursework that you end up taking. So if you um, are an environmental science student with a concentration in geospatial technology, uh, the majority of your credits are going to be in the environmental science realm. You're really going to focus on learning the ecology, learning the sustainability, learning the geology, and then you're going to take um, geospatial classes so you learn how to apply that geospatial technology to environmental purposes. But your the majority of your classes is going to be learning that environmental science that that is, that is required to apply specifically for an environmental science position. And then that geospatial, taking all those geospatial classes really gives you an edge on the job market because everything environmental has a spatial component to it. Um, and so it is critical um, that somebody entering in the, the uh, environmental science field knows how to use uh, GIS. And that is why we partner so often with the geospatial technology. But you would be trained to take any environmental science position, whether it required GIS or not. And so that would be the bulk of your credits. And then you would take enough of the geospatial classes um, in order to be really competitive and have that knowledge on how to apply all of those tools to environmental issues. Yeah, and then the distinction from the geospatial technology degree standpoint is um, you're not necessarily focusing on a specific domain like environmental science. You're, you're focusing on expanding your skills within geospatial technology. So many schools will offer you one, two, or even maybe even three GIS classes uh, as part of a curriculum within another program. But the geospatial technology students at Harrisburg University, as I mentioned earlier, take some computer science classes. They're learning Python, they're learning spatial databases, and potentially, uh, well, and they're taking the policy and management class. Those courses, while they are available to the environmental science students, aren't the core of the analysis and the tool set that environmental students need. Uh, these are sort of the extended skill sets that um, really many of my graduates are finding. You know, Hey, you know, I should have. I need to make sure I'm really paying attention to, to the Python class because, you know, I found that if I want to advance in my career, uh, I need to have some knowledge of that. So it's um, on the geospatial side, it's those same analytical tools that are developed within the concentration for environmental science, but you take it to the next step with some of the application development and database skills, which, which again distinguishes you not only from our environmental science program, but really from any other degree where you're learning GIS at least that I'm familiar with in the state and surrounding region. All right, thank you. So we got two questions here to wrap this up. Um, first one for Dr. Proctor. Um, this is somebody who's interested in forestry. Um, would you say that that individual should study ecology? Absolutely. 
Um, so ecology is um, key to understanding the aspects of what makes a, a healthy forest or in doing even in forestry management, um, anywhere from timber management to water quality to ecosystem services, any of those applications of forestry, they're all based in ecology. Um, and we have many classes within the program, so ecology is required. Um, uh, requirement for the degree, but we have ecosystem restoration and management and um, uh, conservation biology. All of those deal with the application of ecology to things such as forestry, particularly ecosystem restoration and management. It, it really focuses a lot on how do you use those ecological concepts to do active forest management or habitat management. Um, and uh, Nathan Regal, our uh, corporate faculty member who works for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, he is a forester who teaches ecological concepts of forestry, um, which is why we're so happy to have him as part of our program. All right, thank you. And this last one for Dr. Sarvis here um, about drone technology. Um, and how how much is drone technology implemented in geospatial technology? And also, will students be earning any certifications in drone tech and drone flight through the geospatial technology program? Yeah, good question. So um, we have, it's been about three and a half, maybe four years since the university started using drones, um, mostly for the mapping and environmental monitoring that we talked about. Um, so far, all of our drone equipment is available to students for their independent research. Um, and it and and we are now in, in, in discussions about offering a second remote sensing class that will not only cover the use and application of drones and the drone technology, the sensors, the flying, all that, but also include a component that covers the, the education required to get your part 107 remote pilot certificate from the FAA. Um, and so we, we've been very purposeful um, about developing this program, uh, developing our own expertise. We actually have three uh, certified remote pilots within the university, all of, all of us, well, two other than me, uh, that work at the Center, the Center for Applied, and Ge Applied Environmental and Geospatial Technology. Um, so they're also there as support for students who want to use drones. And as I just mentioned, this new Remote Sensing 2 class, which should be on the books in the next 12 to 18 months, um, and students wouldn't take until their junior or senior year, will have uh, the drone component as, a, as an academic component of the program. But again, anybody is available to use the technology um, and learn it on their own or build it into one of their applied projects that they do uh, through experiential learning. Um, so we've embraced the technology. Um, obviously, again, it, it overlaps with environmental science. Uh, one of the cool things we're hoping to do this summer is get a new sensor that's multispectral. So we're not just looking at thermal and visual, but all sorts of parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that really opens up our ability to take what used to be a very um, sort of esoteric and somewhat removed use of satellite imagery from federal and, and other international organizations and actually being able to collect similar data on our own with our own devices, which is really pretty cool. So a lot a lot on the horizon for that and a lot already in place. All right, thank you both so much. Um, I hope everybody found this informative. Um, and as I mentioned, this was recorded. So if you'd like to go back and rewatch it, um, this link is available, uh, or this webinar is available at the link I posted in the chat. And we'll also be emailing it out afterwards as well. Thank you both so much. Um, and everybody take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.